I start record. Here we go. Thank you, everybody, for coming for our um, uh, weekly um, uh, talk at our uh, uh, Department of Marine Geosciences Sciences weekly seminar series. And um, today we are very much excited to host uh, Dr. So uh, Reut Soreka Bramovich from the Dead Sea and Arava Science Center here in Israel. Uh, although we are in the same country, we are she's in the south, we are in the north, and we are still zooming everything due to the COVID uh, pandemic, zooming to Israel and to all the rest of the world, by the way. So uh, Reut uh, Soreka Bramovich, she is an astrobiologist at the Dead Sea and Arava Science Center in Mitzpah Ramon and also in Masada in Israel. Topics of her, of her research includes extremophile adaptation and cross-contamination challenges in future planetary exploration, which is absolutely exactly on time since we just landed on Mars. Graduated from uh, um, the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia in 2013. And she is an International Space University core lecturer for the Space Studies program in astrobiology. Um, she uh, also followed the marine microbiology research at uh, Barilan University from 2013 to 2016, and a co founder and co current chairperson of the Israeli Mars Society, which also we encourage everybody of you if you want to join. Former director of the N New South Wales chapter in the Mars Society of Australia between 2009 and 2013, and participant in NASA's spaceward bound field expedition in South Australia in 2009. Wow. Former chief scientist and co founder of D Mars, Desert Mars Analog Ramon Station between 2017 and 2020 an analog astronaut, and in 2020, she was invited to participate at the UN United States Department of State International Visitor Leadership Program for 2020. Wow, what a TV, and actually, which is actually the, uh, <laughs> the International uh, Women's Day, so uh, we are totally honored for hosting you in our uh, seminar room. The podium is yours. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much for that detailed, uh, for that very uh, detailed ex uh, explanation and presentation. I'm very happy to be here today. I'm uh, really excited to meet uh, new people and new faces, and also say hello to Amos Pumkin, who just entered. Hi, Amos. <laughs> You're one of the ground, uh, one of the fathers of the area in astrobiology in Israel. So it's, I'm very honored to be on the same Zoom with you. Thank you very much. And without further ado, because it's already uh, 15 minutes after two in Israel, so we're going to start my presentation. If you have questions at the end, just write them down and Nicholas will help us to choose the questions and we'll see how we go. Okay, so I hope you'll enjoy my presentation and let's go for it. So I'm sharing my screen right now with my presentation. And here we go. If there's any issues, just let me know. So basically, uh, I'm an astrobiologist. I'm really interested in astrobiology ever since I was a young girl. Uh, I started to do my uh, master's and PhD in Australia in 2006. And I really like extreme environments. I like the analogy of studying life on planet Earth and from that understanding what could happen in some place else in the universe and in our solar system. I am not muted now. Uh, these are some photos from my work along the years with stromatolites in Shark Bay in Western Australia. I also worked in um, North Australia and Western Australia and also in South Australia in the Pilbara region. Uh, these are a few of my buddies from the International Space University. I had a very, very short stint with NASA Ames Research Center with Professor Chris McKay, Dr. Chris McKay. And in my, as a marine microbiologist, I had to go on ships a few times and do some sampling there and um, uh, endure the physical limitations that sometimes happen with scientists work in the field. I really believe in exploration. I think you can be an excellent scientist if you go out to the field, if you incur, if you incur and if you find out the things that interest you and you have to work on them in the field. Uh, I, I'm at my best when I'm outside, when I do science outside. 
And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, some of the photos here are also from the International Space, uh, Ilan Ramon International Space Conference, which I'm using vo usually volunteer as a panelist or as a moderator. And I really much, and I very much believe in all my outreach and all my outreach programs in promoting living and working in space, basically. So before we start, um, uh, this is Mars. This is a bit of a gift situation of Mars. It's not the best high res picture of it. But I really wanted to think for a few seconds, like, why do we need to go to Mars? I mean, it's so far away. <laughs> the estimates of a mission to Mars are usually between 400 to 500 million, million, sorry, billion dollars. So what's the deal? Why should we go to Mars? And when I do these uh, presentations with audiences, I usually do pause and I do a lot of discussion about it. And sometimes people come and say, no, we shouldn't go to Mars. It's a bad idea. We need all that money to do stuff here on planet Earth and make sure that we survive the next few decades. And some people say, no, we should go to Mars. There's a thin atmosphere, but perhaps it's a second place for us to live as a human species. We should probably find another home. And for me, the answer is, has basically always been along the lines like for instance, with people like Carl Sagan and others who basically spoke that the human species, we as a living form, we are explorers and we are best when we go outside and we start exploring things. And it enhances our borders. It enhances our uh, inner spirituality, our inner characteristics. Um, I'm not perhaps putting it in the right words, but basically when we go out and we explore, we are the best that we can be. And if you look at the history of human population, then we always go out and we explore. Sometimes it's conquering and it's military operations and it's not very nice, but other things like Darwin on the Beagle expedition. And when we put it into a scientific context, context, context then we actually learn a lot more. Here's something from 2016. I hope you can hear it pretty well. This was produced by SpaceX, a company that was born in 2002 by Elon Musk, which up till then was a San Francisco high-tech entrepreneur. And in this vision, he explains and shows how he wants to put the first 100 people on Mars. The beauty is that this is based on engineering schematics. It's not an artistic impression. Maybe the sky is, but not everything else is pretty much based on engineering schematics. This is the super heavy <clears throat> rocket that's gonna come out from Cape Canaveral, going outside of our atmosphere. And on the top of it, there's a starship. I hope you can all hear and see it very well, this nice video. So this is the stage separation. This booster, this rocker go rocket goes straight back to planet Earth. It lands exactly where it's supposed to land, according to SpaceX engineers. <clears throat> and this technology has been proven by SpaceX in the last decade or so. So we can have a reusable rocket now and drastically lower launch costs. <clears throat> Starships now merge together for fueling, refueling in spaceship in orbit, which is something which has not been tested yet, but will be tested in the year to come by SpaceX. 
And again, one of the Starship tankers goes back to planet Earth, but the other one goes straight to Mars. A very long voyage, very long. And after a while, you know, they won't be able to see planet Earth. They will go past the moon and they will go into the interplanetary <clears throat> space, all dark, with a few distant stars to shine their way. The furthest humans have ever been from planet Earth. <clears throat> Solar panels are used today at the International Space Station and are a proven technology to supply energy and electricity to the starship. And soon they arrive at Mars. In the very distant futures, according to Elon Musk, we will be able to do something which is called terraforming for Mars, which is a big issue. But what I wanted to tell you is that you are in the generation that's going to see a human on Mars. Um, Elon Musk and SpaceX in particular, but other companies as well, such as Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin and others, are boosting up the new space sector and are allowing us more than ever to talk about a real future for people on Mars and on the moon. So I expect really big things in the next 15 years. So stay tuned for all these uh, exciting times. And just to give you a hint about what things to come, SpaceX is one of the few space companies which learns a lot from its challenges and mistakes. So what you see here basically was already, uh, is now a proven technology since 2018 and actually from 2016. And we now have the Falcon 9 by SpaceX, a rocket which instead of just being launched to space and then completely dismantle itself when it comes back to planet Earth, it now lands back exactly where it was supposed to land. Tar I targeted landing also can be, uh, also can land today on a, uh, <clears throat> off the sea on a seashore uh, area. And so the cost of launching things to space has been reduced drastically, which means more commercial and more people in more countries can join and do magnificent things in space. So this was in 2018 Expedition. and in 2020, Liftoff. they the actually Falcon produced and crew, Dragon, go NASA, go SpaceX, Godspeed, bottom dog. And, and actually in, two, in 2020, uh, SpaceX was the first commercial company in the, in the world that was able to take as American astronauts from the US to the International Space Station and back using its own developed uh, space, spaceship, which is, which is called the Dragon. And the Dragon can carry either crew or uh, a crew plus uh, payload of different kinds. And that was an amazing achievement and it only happened in 2020. And now what we're looking at is that we're looking at 2021. And in 2021, we actually have a real model, a real prototype that has been tested 10 versions of it, of the Starship that you've seen in the video from 2016. So this Starship, which is called, this is the version 10, so it's called SN10. Just recently, we're talking the 3rd of March, <laughs> this month actually, uh, has landed successfully back after going up to 10 kilometers height. And after several minutes, um, This is not an animation, this is the real thing. It's quite exciting. And about eight minutes after this starship was sitting there, it actually exploded due to some fuel from the uh, fuel.
there you go, kaboom. So it's really nice to see these things. I'm really happy with the pace at which SpaceX is, you know, blowing up its spaceships and its rockets and its starships and whatever. These things are going to be amazing. They're going to carry more than 100 plus tons of equipment and crew. It has a really big volume inside, 1,100 cubic meter. And when it will stand on top of the super heavy rocket that you've seen in the first video, it will actually be more than 120 meters in height. So it's a mammoth of a thing. There's nothing as large, as big, as high, as massive there is on planet Earth at the moment. And while people do say that Elon Musk is sometimes a crazy person, I actually have to tell you that I think he's a crazy person. But when you look at the accomplishments at the pace of which his company is working at, there's actually um, a good, it's a good spot to be positive about, about whether or not we're actually going to get to Mars and to the moon. So. Moving forward to Mars. It's very hard to get there. It takes about six to nine months to get to Mars. <clears throat> However, let's talk about the fun facts about Mars so you can get to know the planet a bit better and ask yourself whether there's a place for you on the exploration expedition. So to begin with, of course, the Mars uh, orbits the sun further away from and is relatively to planet Earth, and it takes twice as much as uh, planet Earth. So one Martian years is basically two years on planet Earth. If we look inside the planet, and this is a photo, very nice talk, photo taken by the previous rover called Curiosity, which is still functional on Mars. This is in the Gale Crater. It's a very ancient uh, dry lake. It's about three point, excuse me, <clears throat> it's about 3.6 to 3.8, uh, perhaps even 4 billion years old dry lake bed. It has a lot of mud-sized grain and mudstones, has a lot of desiccation going on, going, going on. But if you look at the data from, uh, especially from Curiosity, all um, instruments on board, it seems that there has been liquid water perhaps for tens of thousands of years, but perhaps even millions of years going around there. And the question is, if 4 billion years ago, planet Mars was similar to planet Earth, could there be life there? Could there be underneath the ground? Could there be in caves? Maybe there's underground lakes. We don't know anything that's happening behind, or it's not behind, underneath, um, underneath the surface, but this is a very interesting topic to talk about. When we know more about Mars is the fact that it has, it's smaller than Earth in mass and it has 40% gravity only. So you can jump higher. Perhaps you don't need as many stairs if you want to climb up in your home. It has a lot of implication for architecture and things that you want to build there. But basically you can bring more things because they're going to weigh less on Mars. And if we look at this very nice panoramic, so this is again, this is from Gale Crater and took by Curiosity. It's about 3.6, this section is about 3.6 billion years old, has a lot of sand, sandstones and the main chemical compositions of this area in, on Mars in the Gale Crater has a lot of silicate and afterwards has a lot of iron oxides. But it has other minerals and very interesting stuff later that we can use if we want to, for instance, have some sort of an industrial or use this um, minerals for other things as well. And we have semactite clay minerals. All of this are really big indication as well that in the past, this area was wet and perhaps harbored life. Mars atmosphere, as most of you probably know, is really lethal to humans at the moment <laughs> in general. It has, it's mostly out of carbon dioxide. It's very thin, it's about six millibar pressure. Uh, which is a lot less than planet Earth. It has no oxygen on it. The temperatures are also very low. Because there's no magnetic field on Mars, there is nothing that will deflect high energy particles, which means the surface of Mars constantly being bombarded by really high energy particles from the sun, from gamma radiation bursts in the, in the universe and in, in our galaxy. It's a pretty bad place for anything with DNA or protein or lipids to be on the surface at the moment. They're, these conditions are very, very harmful. Another really nice, uh, I think, environmental <laughs> characteristic of Mars is that it has dust devils. In Israel, we do have dust devils as well. Everybody going down south on road number 14 usually see these 
uh, dust devils going around, uh, circling around the car, especially in areas which are less populated. On Mars, because of the low atmospheric pressure and because of the non-biological essence of a 3.5 billion year old planet, these dust, uh, these dust devils are very common in some areas, up to thousands of them dancing around. And because of the low atmospheric pressure, they actually can get very tall. They can get up to one kilometer, perhaps five kilometers height. And it's pretty impressive to see that, but you have to realize there's no momentum to it. So it's not like a hurricane that can lift things and can you know, harm you and shove things at you and things like that, and perhaps pick up a cow, but no, these are very gentle creatures, but they do look very impressive and they can get very, very tall. This is also an implication that the amount of dust on the surface of Mars is enormous, absolutely enormous. And when you have dust, it's really problematic for any mechanics that you have, any electri electrical com com component that you might have. It will definitely get fried because perhaps of electrostatic, uh, electrostatic problems. So dust is a big issue on Mars. It's smaller, it has lesser volume and about, six Mars can go into the volume of planet Earth. And this is a demonstration of what happens when there is a dust storm on planet Mars. Planet Mars does not have ocean, does not have lakes. And therefore, when there's a dust storms and it happens almost uh, every year, it can last between three up to even five months. It can cover the entire planet. It goes for on for months and it completely covers the sky. So for instance, if you have a rover as such as Opportunity that was relying solely on solar panels, then after five months without any energy coming from the sun, uh, eventually it died out. So it died out in 2018. And actually Opportunity was a very successful rover. It worked for about 14 years since its landing in the beginning of 2000 and something. And, uh, Dust is a big issue, just as I've said before. Temperature wise, the average is minus 63 Celsius. It's pretty, pretty cold. However, on the equator in a good summer day, really, really close to the surfer, you actually can get above zero. In those areas that sometimes you can see traces of liquid water that then vanishes completely because there's a low atmospheric pressure. So everything boils autom automatically and just, um, how do you say it? I want to say la brie, and of course the word there's a there's a precise word for it in English, and it evaporates very very quickly. So we can go from minus forty degrees, very cold, to up to thirty degrees on a good summer day. But also, it's very short; doesn't happen very often, and it happens only on the surface of Mars. So if you're looking for good conditions for human beings, there are not on Mars as we see it today. And we're talking about. How is Perseverance doing? And where's Perseverance in landing? And what's the big idea? What's the big issue with the current uh, rover that's uh, on Mars? So in February, we actually had three things happening on Mars. In February, we had the Americans sending down uh, the Perseverance, Perseverance rover with its uh, helicopter, tiny helicopter called Ingenuity. We had the Chinese um, going into orbit for the first time ever for China to go to, to Mars, to the red planet, and they plan on sending a lander and sending a rover of their own in May this year. So a couple of months from now, first time ever for China to try this kind of a thing. We're, we're wishing them good luck. And we had a vehicle, a spaceship coming from the United Emirates, and that was sent from Japan, and it's now uh, circling in orbit, and it's testing the atmosphere and looking, I think, for, uh, for methane signatures, but I'm not sure, but it's definitely testing the atmosphere, and it will remain in orbit for as long as possible. So currently, the rover Perseverance is in a place called Jezero Crater, and we'll talk about it in a minute. This is how it landed. Again, this okay, is real okay, footage. Shoot the boy. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 440 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. So the separation stage and everything was done pretty much as was done with previous rovers as Curiosity and Opportunity. Both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about 10 kilometers, nine and a half. So I don't know if you ever seen how something lands onto Mars, but this is the best footage there is in the world. And it excites me every time to see this, how something is landing pretty softly, I would say almost up till the end on a completely different planet in our 
solar system. Net filter converge. Velocity solution 3.3 meters per second. Altitude 7.4 kilometers. Now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second. 6.6 kilometers of the surface. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. Still using a parachute. And from the parachute, they're going to put the rover away from the lander. And subsequently, the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. Amazing. Still descending very fast using a new uh, navigation technology. Okay. So the rover itself is taking, the lander itself is taking um, solutions and how to navigate and land correctly in the area that was designated for it. It's an onboard automatic system. Look at that. That's Mars. Back shell set. Current velocity is 83 Those are sand dunes. That's a lake bed covered in a lot of dust. That's an impact crater within an impact crater within an impact crater. The divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second. Riverbeds. Of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Now watch how much dust this this stage is causing. Completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second. Altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. Look at that. Sky crane maneuver has started. Lowering the rover. About 20 meters. The left the side picture on top is from the bottom looking up, and the left picture down is looking Station down on the control. rover. Tango, Tango Delta. Delta, touchdown. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of half life. Adorable, aren't they? Um, we have been sending stuff to Mars since the 1950s, actually. And we, the main senders were usually uh, the um, United States and also USSR, the Soviets. Um, currently, most missions by the Soviets have failed. Some of the missions by the European have succeeded, but the most um, agency and country in the world that has a successful landing uh, capabilities is the United States via JPL and it's NASA. So Jezero Crater or Jezero Crater, it's actually a word in Yugoslavia, which means a lake. And that's how it was decided basically uh, to, to name it after a lake in, in Yugoslavia, after the name lake in Yugoslavia. Uh, there were many, many debates whether to land here or not. The whole issue of how you land something on Mars is a big debate. There's a planetary, there's the defense uh, planetary committee. And I'm not saying that uh, correctly that word, but basically there's a committee in NASA in the United States, which basically has like hundreds of scientists in it. And they're saying, okay, we need to protect Mars from kind of um, contamination, whether it's something that we bring there or something that might hop on our, our stuff. We don't want to contaminate anything that might change how our scientific instruments are working, how our engineering working. We don't want to harm any potential big issue or um, not big issue, but we don't want to, to harm any way um, the, even the slightest chance that we actually can find life or remnants of life or biosignatures of life on Mars. So till now, till Jezero Crater, NASA always chose to land in areas which were interesting from a geological point of view, from a climate point of view, from an environmental point of view, from the history of Mars point of view, but never areas which might have distinct, um, distinct biosignatures. And Yezero Crater is the first place that after many um, hyperspectral and other analysis from MRO and other equipment uh, from the vehicles um, orbiting Mars that has been uh, dedicated in that, that it's old enough, it's about four, almost four billion years old, but it definitely has carbonates, it definitely has silicates, it definitely has areas that might preserve uh, microbial life forms, might be pre even preserve stromatolites, which is one of the things that I did in my PhD. And so they said, we're gonna send the rover with a lot of um, physical instruments, with a lot of cameras that might look at it, but also we wanna try and do a sample return mission eventually, which means that this rover is gonna take samples, gonna put it in containers, 
and we're going to leave the containers <laughs> on the surface for the next mission that might get there in 2026 or 2027. And then we'll collect those samples and we bring them back to home. Because basically, after many, many years of sending really sophisticated rovers, if you want to look at life or fossilized life, it, it, NASA realized that it would be better to get samples and bring them back to really well-equipped labs back here on planet Earth, or even stop at the way at the International Space Station if you are afraid from contamination issues. But anyways, bring them back home to labs on here, here on planet Earth that can maintain the same condition can take really good care of potential um, potential contamination issues and that's why they decided on a sample return mission so this is the Ezero crater we're going to see a lot of interesting pictures coming from uh, the rover from perseverance um, it's very very nice the um, perseverance itself is a, about a ton <laughs> about a ton of a car. I mean, it's a few thousand kilos. It has 23 cameras, like gazillions of cameras. From an interesting point of view, I'm going, we are all going to be interested whether the sample collection robot arm is working, whether you can put it inside the container, whether it can collect the rocks, can collect the regolith, can collect everything okay. And we're going to be very interested, and I'm going to be very interested to see, of course, Ingenuity, which is a small helicopter which was tested in a special Mars chamber here on Earth. It has uh, four blades. It's connected with a power cable to the main hub, which is the rover, and it should hover for about, I would say, 30 centimeters, perhaps half a meter. It should hover for less than a minute. It's going to do it maybe five times in the entire mission, and it's a proof of concept issue. So we'll see if that works okay. MOXIE is an interesting uh, catalyst, basically. It's an equipment that takes um, two uh, carbon dioxide molecules and, produced, um, and produces oxygen and two carbon monoxide uh, molecules. And it, and it can, um, and it can um, gather the oxygen in a small container. So the MOXIE that has been sent on the rover is just a proof of concept as well. It's a small proof of concept uh, equipment. It's gonna produce between six to 10 grams of oxygen per hour. And the real thing in order for humans to really <clears throat> enjoy pure oxygen from the atmosphere of Mars, gonna need something like maybe 50 times bigger, and they're gonna need multiple units of these things in order to get at least, at least 200 grams of oxygen um, per hour for them, for them to work. So we'll see how, how Preservance is going. If you're interested in playing around a little bit with it, I uh, really recommend using an app by JPL, which is called Spacecraft AR. Basically, it opens up in a 3D. It opens up uh, any, any of the spaceships, any of the rovers, any of the equipment that JPL has sent over the years. And you can put it inside your home. You can put it in your yard. You can put it everywhere around. You can take a photo. You can. You can send it to your friends, you can upload it to the Facebook, you can do whatever you want with it. But on the face of it, you can really zoom in. You can really see uh, the different engineering parts and how the cables are work. I mean, it's an excellent job in, uh, in outreach in, in that department. And when we're talking about Earth versus Mars, we're testing some of these things on Earth today before we send them out to Mars, of course. So take a minute and take a look at these pictures. And if you want, you can just write down <clears throat> in the chat, if you will, or wherever it is that you want to chat, which of these pictures, there are seven pictures here, which of them from Earth and which of them, which of these picture is from Mars, right? So take just maybe five seconds. I'm going to count to five and there's seven pictures. So just start writing down which one is Earth. Is one from Earth? Is two from Earth? Is three from Earth? Is four from Earth or Mars? Five Earth or Mars? Is six Earth or Mars? And seven Earth or Mars? So I want you to keep in mind these pictures and figure out if you can, which one is from Earth and which one is from Mars, because it's relevant for the, for the topic coming up later on. So let's talk about part B, which is astrobiology. <clears throat> and it is connected eventually to finding life on Mars and how important it is for astrobiologists and for the entire human, for us as humanity to find life elsewhere in the universe. So why should we search for life? Hmm? Why should we? What's the point, really? Why should we search for life? There is a philosophical co component to it for sure. However, when I look at life, 
and I look at it from a scientific point of view and from a human being in the 20th century, I'm pretty much sure that I know exactly why we need to search for life. And that is because we need, we use life today for a lot of medicines. We use life today to make our food, our drinks. We have gut microbiota, which basically apparently control our moods, control our hormones, even control our thoughts perhaps to a certain extent. They definitely control our health. And we do a really good job at harvesting different pigments and different secondary metabolites from microbes or algae or anything. And we put it into lifestyle products. So basically when we search for life, we search for things that improve our understanding of the world for sure, but also improve our own life and uh, life of our, the people that we care about. So what is astrobiology? And astrobiology is uh, a multidisciplinary science, basically, okay? So we're talking in astrobiology, we're talking a lot about the origin of life. We're talking about the evolution of life. If, uh, how did life specifically started? How do you define life? Was the first molecule of life, was it a DNA? Was it a protein? Was it an amino acid? Was it a membrane? I mean, how did that thing come up? We know there were probably first unicellular life forms before they got into be multicellular life forms, but how the, the, the whole thing managed to come together? It's an interesting issue. Evolution is a big, big topic in how uh, life has evolved on planet Earth because if it has evolved on planet earth and it had so many different variations, and perhaps we know a little bit, we can speculate better about evolution of life on different planets. Atomic and organic elements. So there are six elements which are common throughout the universe and are common in our solar system. And those are oxygen, phosphite, uh, sulfur, nitrogen, hydrogen, and carbon. And what I'm saying with this is that we are biological beings. We are built mostly from these atomic elements, okay? from these basic elements. And if I am built from those basic elements and they are the common elements in the universe, I won't be expecting to find something built out of gold or out of copper or anything else which is less common. It's a matter of basically statistics, I would say, of probability. When we talk about primordial soup, it's actually a bunch of uh, theories and how life has started, what were was it panspermia? Was it perhaps something else? And we're talking about um, you know, primordial soup ha is, a, is a topic that Darwin has um, talked about quite a lot in saying, what if we had a really you know, small pond of warm water? What if we had the right ingredients? What if we had the right energy for it? We had lightning that would, would work. If we had heating that might work. If we had the right energy sources, then things would start to, to come together and perhaps produce the molecules. And then the molecules between themselves might start doing things, very interesting things and share some sort of a very basic metabolism. So how did life start on planet earth? what kind of theories do we have? We have the RNA world, we have the lipid world, we have a lot of interesting things going into that. Habitability is the stuff that I used to work on uh, during my PhD mainly, and it's about extremophiles. We know today, especially microorganisms, can survive magnificently harsh, unbelievably tough conditions. And that's pretty amazing for us and for scientists, especially in the last decades to understand that and how their genetic code is modified, how their you know, special ecological niches are adapted. How slowly do they grow? How fast do they mutate? It's an interesting topic, extremophiles, because it turns out, a lot, turns out that things can survive in minus degrees. Things can survive in 135 degrees. Things not only can survive, but they can thrive when you have, you know, a Dead Sea high salinity concentrations. Microbes and product is not a per se things that come from astrobiology, but I tell people that we look into extremophiles because we want to find interesting products from extremophiles. And detection is a big issue as well because, okay, we sent a rover, it has 23 cameras. Are 23 cameras are a good way to find life forms? For astrobiology, the answer is no. <laughs> We really need to send other things. And some people here are marine ge uh, geologists perhaps. So for instance, in marine biotech, there's actually excellent ways today to, to, to deploy different types of equipment, different types of submarines, submersible. We're talking about gliders, submersibles. We're talking about facts. We're talking about uh, in, situ, um, <clears throat> in situ microscopy that can work underwater. Everything that can 
sort of semi-autonomously report back on the minute quantities of something that it's living that has a chlorophyll pigment, for instance. It's a very interesting equipment that we would like to use in astrobiology. And, fine, and finally, I'm talking also a lot about, also a lot about, you know, um, time scales. Time scales are, are pretty interesting things in, in astrobiology because when you look at the, uh, on our planet, on planet Earth, when you look at it, basically, what happens is that along the history, we had at least five massive extinctions, five massive extinctions, after which we see new departments in life ecological niches, new taxonomical, you know, species, genuses, sometimes even phylogenetic or, you know, orders and phylogenetic groups. We see completely new life forms that weren't there before. So our conclusion from all this basically is that if life could survive mass extinctions on planet earth in four in a in a measure of 4.5 billion years then perhaps life can survive extinctions on other planets the issue is that if you go and you look at a different planet are you looking at it while it's going while it's just now finished a mass extinction and you can't find anything or are you looking at it after it has adapted and you're looking at it at a time frame, which is now it's alive? So it's an interesting topic. And astrobiology also looks at the future of life in the universe. And uh, this nice fellow with, uh, with the glasses here at the bottom of the, uh, the, bottom of the screen is Frank Drake, uh, an astrono uh, American astronomer, basically, who is the father of the Drake equation from 1960. 62, I think it was done. And basically the Drake equation is a very interesting way of trying to figure out the probability of finding a, a civilized, civil, uh, to find an intelligent civilization out there in the universe. Uh, it's mostly an equation about popular science. It's not a really scientific equation, if you ask me, because at least more than half of the probability of half of its factors are basically complete guesses. And they are, um, and they are defined in a way that scientists cannot even find the way to talk and to find the number and to find the factor and to find the actual value to put in that uh, equation. So you can play with that one. It's very, very nice. And there's really a lot of things to say about astrobiology, but we don't have um, a lot more time for it. So what I wanted to say is that this, is, this all comes up back to me in saying, we can study Mars on Earth. We can study the technology needed for humans to survive on Earth. We can do science on Earth that will be the science that we want to do on, on Mars itself. And this is a very nice photo taken by Professor Odeda Onson from the Weizmann Institute during uh, my mission, which was in 2018. And I was one of those Ramanats walking in the desert in the Ramon Crater. And the Ramon Crater is a nature reserve in the south of Israel. And it's absolutely drop dead gorgeous. And it also has some characteristics that are very similar to Mars. It has uh, volcanic basalts. It has clays, lots of different types of clays. It has also rare elements, but those are not that interesting. But the whole feeling of having an analog mission, a mission which simulates a space mission, specifically one on Mars, it has a lot to offer. So me and a group, a bunch of people decided that we want to do something which is called an analog mission. And we had an architect to design this special habitat. And we had a lot of support from different people, from the Israeli Space Agency, from the ICA Foundation, from the Weizmann Institute. And what we did was this, that we had this hub. And we did an analog mission for several days in which we, I was inside together with five other people. We were in complete isolation. We went out only with the simulated spacesuits. Uh, we had helmets on. We had boots on. We had a personal life support system on. And I had to do a lot of experiments outside, you know, breathing pretty hard um, with the spacesuits and everything. And I looked at desert varnish and I was trying to do all sorts of microbial and sampling stuff. And then I came back into the very small and basic lab that I had inside the habitat. And since 2018, um, this thing has been going pretty, pretty strong. And it goes well with the general theme of of, of the new space that we're trying to do here in Israel. So we had the Bereshit project, uh, which uh, crash landed on the, on the moon uh, when it tried to win the Google X prize, um, the Google X Lunar X prize contest. And I was a volunteer there and I was very happy to, to support that project. 
And then now we're working on Bereshit 2 as well. And I really urge you that if you come to Israel, you should come and look at the Ramon Crater. Some of the science experiments that we did do in the last two years there. So we had an in situ resource utilization. How can 3D printing uh, work on Mars? Microbial, uh, microbiology, of course, looking for potential contamination. I was looking into forward and backward contamination by a human crew going out, taking samples. So what, what from the outside comes inside and stays? And perhaps what's, when the, the crew comes on Mars, they're gonna have so many bacteria with them on their skin, on their equipment, nothing is gonna be sterilized 100%. So are these things going out? Do they go, do they undergo some sort of mutation? Do they evolve into something else? Something that I've just started to look into. We had things related to nuclear physics, some meteorological, we had robotics. Uh, we were, had a proposal from Tel Aviv University using uh, robot digger swarms to do a swarm of different robotics to do, to help with the different functionality of building a habitat. And we also had an interesting psychological, we always get actually psychological proposal, but this one was from Palo Alto University, which basically looked at identifying sleep related stressors in a Mars analog simulation crew. And I would be uh, most happy to talk more about science done in analog missions here in Israel. And of course, we're using it a lot to encourage the young people of Israel, uh, high school students. Uh, this is a program I'm now managing for its, I would say, ooh, third year, no, fourth year uh, through the Arava and Dead Sea Institute. And basically what we do is that we take uh, high school students and we teach them a lot about space and space sciences, but we also talk about space medicine. We talk about space architecture. Um, we talk about, of course, astronomy, and we talk about astrophysics, and we talk about uh, planetary sciences, sciences, um, geology, astrobiology, but we also train them, try, it's high school students after all, we try to train them as a team, as a team of astronauts. And eventually they have to go into this uh, habitat and they have to live three days in complete isolation and come out only you know, for extra vehicle activity, which uh, they have a very precise daily schedule. Um, they have to make their own food. They have to make their own experiments. They have uh, to report back to mission control, which is usually the, um, which is usually us, uh, the managers and the guides and the, and the teachers. And they have to do so even though the, they are on a Mars, which means there's a delay in communication for about 10 minutes to each direction because of the distance. And so it's a very interesting uh, educational program. I'm very happy to, to, to be associated and to lead and to develop it. This year with the COVID, we had a lot of issues. However, we were able to overcome them. So basically we did a lot of the lessons online and we had a few, but very important uh, field trips. And I hope that by the end of March, my students will be able to go inside the habitat uh, some of them are vaccinated, some of them will come with uh, negative uh, testing of Corona, of COVID-19, and we're going to make it work. And they're going to have to survive on Mars by themselves for three days. Hopefully no one will break a leg. So this is me. Thank you very much for listening for the entire time. And now I've, I'll be happy um, to answer questions, please. Thank you very much, Reut. Um, it was really exciting, your talk, really excited um, subject, uh, opening a lot of options. I'm absolutely sure that uh, we are just uh, even before the beginning, right? Um, okay, <laughs> so I don't see all the faces, but uh, if you have a question, so just pop in, ask it or write it in the chat. Actually, hi, I have a question. Go ahead. Sure. I wanted to ask, like, you are so excited about this big spaceship, and they are really massive, and they are really cool. But what do you think about, like, spending, for example, like, 10 years investing in nuclear energy so we don't have to use, like, oil and gas for going to Mars, mm -hmm. and then we can invest in science and try to find, like, more... Uh, convenient uh, source of energy from some, I don't know, nuclear um, elements. But what do you think? Do you think it's a waste of time? And, or it's just yeah. 
maybe yeah. more about your personal thought more about your personal thoughts yeah so my personal thoughts it's not that it's uh, either this or either that i think the money distribution very much affects what you do with the money so um the money when you when you use a lot of money for new space then it means that it's a lot of money that doesn't go for, you know, uh, weapons and wars and defense satellites and things like that. So that's the first thing you have to know. Most of the space industry for generation was about defense, was about spy satellites and was about, you know, the Star Wars era with Reagan and, and the Chinese to, to some part are still doing much more uh, of their um, space activity that relates more to defense and to, to things like that than it does for, for pure science. So first of all, within that magnitude of the entire you know, space sector, I'm really, really happy that they're putting things and that Elon Musk as a private, in, as a private in, entrepreneur actually is pushing, every, pushing the envelope and pushing people to put their money in something which is not defense, which is not intelligence, which is not let's, you know, let's, let's go over ballistic rockets and see when they fly over China or something like that. So that's the first thing. Um, second of all, people are looking into alternative energy. When you look uh, into the amount of money that goes in, in the US itself, uh, that goes through the Department of Energy, that goes for other things as well, it's a lot more money than what I've just discussed, than what just you know Elon Musk is doing with SpaceX or Blue Region or anything, any one of those people. And I think it's really important to, to understand that even if you do find nuclear energy, it's not gonna solve your problem so much. So it's not that I'm doing something. So going to space is not gonna solve everything, but either not you know investing now in nuclear energy specifically. And for instance, one of the things that did come out from one of NASA projects is a one kilowatt uh, nuclear uh, thermal reactor, basically a very small thing based on a nuclear fission pro, uh, nuclear um, fission progress. And they needed that because they said, okay, we need to supply a lot more energy for settlers on Mars or even on the moon. So how do we do it with nuclear energy? How we do it in a, something which is not so heavy, which is not so, not, uh, not will, uh, not will be, not will, <clears throat> sorry, not will affect the settlers and what, they needed a very, simple solution and they didn't want it that will, didn't want something that will provide now 42 megawatts of you know of, of energy so they found this solution uh, through a student contest and they're now working on development so it's a win-win situation in my opinion i think you should put money into nuclear uh, energy as you said and in, into those things but i think that the money that we see now that goes into new space is going to be used only for good things it's not going to be used for bad things yeah okay yeah, thank you for like describing all the stuff that you've been thinking about. And also you said like nuclear energy, you think it won't change a lot. But for instance, if we are talking about stuff like graphene or like new like revolutionary new materials, new exotic materials. Yeah, yeah it will change a lot. Cause like all these spaceships will be so much lighter, they will be so much faster, and uh, you can travel not only to Mars, you can travel to another dimension if you use like super nuclear energy. Okay, I'm talking about like very fantastic things, but stuff that they do in labs and they make a small piece of graphite and have Nobel Prize for that. Maybe if they put more effort, more money into that kind of scientific branch. Maybe they can do better yeah. profit, you know? And of course, yes. use it only for good. We are yes. talking In about agreement. only good profit. Okay? For sure. Thank you. Are there more questions from the audience? Yes, I wanted to ask um, the Young Israeli Astronaut Project. Yes. What is the main purpose of it? Is it more academic or is it more to actually prepare young Israelis for space travel to Mars? Um, I think seeing is believing. So I want to prepare them for going to Mars and also to understand a hell of a lot better what they're going to see when someone is going to be on Mars. They're, they're going to understand it because my students they are taught by the best geologists in Israel. 
So when they come and they see a sheer rock, even if they would see a photo of something from Mars, they will understand what the layering mean, means. And perhaps understanding a bit more about the water history from that sheer rock if they get a bit more data. So for me, it's very important for them to connect, you know, just through the, the, to really understand the data and the visuals that are going to come from Mars. So it's really important for me. But if you're asking concretely what they're getting at, so first of all, they're getting a very unique experiment, which is not available anywhere in the world. There's no youth anywhere in the world that is doing an analog mission. It's a crazy stuff that we're doing here in Israel. I don't know why somebody allowed it for us to do, but we're doing it. And, and they're getting like, um, if they want, and they want to put the time into it, we can offer them accreditation, a few more points into their curriculum. If they also do a serious research project during this, uh, this program. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Ruth. More questions from the audience? I think there's something in the chat. What's in the chat? Ah, oh, okay. Thank you, Karen Weiss. Thank you. So okay. I have a question, Ruth. Sure. Potentially, Thanks. would you like to go to Mars then? I would definitely like to go to Mars. I would like to go first to the moon though, if you don't mind, just for, you know, doing training, but I would definitely like to go to Mars too. So you think we are close to actually send a human to Mars? I think we're close to sending a human to the moon. That's for sure. I think um, Elon Musk is really crazy. Like the timetable he puts at these things, it looks insane from, from NASA point of view and from others, more respectable people that are into this area for decades. But he is progressing really, really fast with his equipment and engineering, which is something nobody has been expecting. Nobody is taking into consideration the rate in which his ingenuity and his company and hundreds of engineers are working night and day to fix all these issues. So the big issues for sending a human to Mars are, it's six to eight months in, at the moment in micro or zero gravity. That has a lot of physiological issues on the human body, a lot of physiological issues. And they are exposed to a lot of radiation between six to eight months as well. So I don't know if some of you have seen, but people who come down from the ISS, not, not after seven days or eight days, but have come down from the ISS after several months, they, they lie down, they put them in special wheelchairs that are basically like uh, grannies, uh, and they take them straight to the, to the, to the airport or to, to the airplane. What happens to the muscles and to our um, balance, uh, balancing senses and everything is so harsh during a flight that when they will come down on Mars, they're going to need a hospital. They're not going to need anything else, but they're going to need like physicians and hospitals and everything just to get their balance back. So it's, it's a big issue. Sending humans to Mars is a really big, big issue, big, big hurdle from a technological point of view and from a physiological point of view. So I don't know how they're going to circumvent that. At the moment, it seems that they're working really hard on the engineering issues, getting the rockets to fly, getting the bigger rockets to fly even better. Everything needs to land back. But whether they're putting effort into the health side of issues, I don't know about that. I haven't heard anything. They say it's a one-way trip, so... Yeah, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to do a one-way trip uh, at, this, at, this, uh, at this age, but uh, okay. I actually read a couple of days ago about Alisa Carson that you probably know. Yes. So she's trained actually to go to Mars apparently, right? No. No? <laughs> I think she's she's a very young student, right? Alisa. Yeah. 18 she's or from 19 the Mars generation. Old. Yeah. Yeah, she's 19 years old. She's from the Mars generation. She's a very enthusiastic American girl. Um, she did all the space camps by NASA, which is something you can do in the US. It's nice, but space camps for children in NASA are basically like, you know, 
they're fun parts. They're not really training. Ah, okay. And I don't know. Yeah, they're not. It's not a really full blown training thing. So it's just to get people the experience and have them understand understand a little better what NASA is doing to its astronauts. Um, what we're going to see is a new type of astronaut. So that's going to be interesting. You're going to see a lot more people going to space, which are not fighter pilots. They haven't gone through, you know, extensive training in Antarctica. You're going to see uh, paraplegic people. You're going to see old people. You're going to see people of different colors going up to space. So it's going to be a much more democratized uh, area, I think, and uh, something to look forward as well. I would be very happy to see much more many more people going up to space and enjoying the view of planet earth you know from from the other side and understanding what a unique planet we have here really a gem <laughs> well with these wonderful words i think that we we need to close <laughs> and uh thank you very much Raoult, for all the time and um sure thank you, you for want... the invitation had a blast if, if you want uh we will be happy to include you in our mailing list for the seminars um, sure. Great. So I will I will include you. So thank you thank everybody. You so thank you. Thank you everybody. Bye bye. See you, see you next week. See you.